one of the things that is going to drive our election and has been driving us economically in the state of Oregon is that $25 billion hole in the PERS system, the Public Employee Retirement System. And the current administration, their answer to fixing that is to, um, is to raise taxes on businesses. So if you, look at, if you look at the state of Oregon's budget, right, the budget is the budget part that, that they fight over in the legislature every year is about $20 billion. That's the general fund part of it, the budget. But the actual budget is like $70 billion. And what that's made up of is your DMV fees, your gas taxes, all, all that money, federal money that they send for schools, property tax money that, that's, or, or uh, uh, let's see. So the, the $20 billion uh, general fund is made up of 95% um, of that is personal income taxes and 5% of that is the business tax. So they keep trying to expand that business tax thinking that they're going to get more revenue to actually pay this PERS deficit down. And so our transpar current transpar transparent governor, she has a, a coalition of people that are supposed to be looking at how to fix this problem and she said all those meetings are going to be open to the public. Right now they're working on trying to figure out how to come up with five billion dollars of new taxes and they close the meetings to the public. I mean it's just like, you know, it's not transparent. But every time that they try to do a gross receipts tax, you remember 98 that was on the ballot, right, that went down in flames. It was going to be a 250 percent increase on businesses. They were going to go from paying a billion dollars every two years to paying three and a half billion dollars every two years. Do you know what that does to businesses in the state of Oregon? It shuts them down. It shuts them down. No kidding. So, so, here, so here we got minimum wage hike, right? It's on a schedule. It's rolling out, okay? And we got businesses trying to figure out, I mean, a lot of restaurants are trying to figure out how do I cover these wages as they keep going on. Talk to a restaurant here, and he says, "You know, I kind of, I think the first two I can kind of handle, but I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get to the next one." Because he says, "You know, the special that I offer, that a lot of seniors come in and get and buy coffee, I got to have to raise that price up." So, when the minimum wage go up, I mean, it affects all prices out there. So, seniors, anybody who's trying to buy something now, all the prices are going up a little bit. So. Now is the time. All those, all those, all those folks out there that are making minimum, minimum wage, they're going to pay more in personal income taxes this year. Would you agree? Yep. They're going to make more money. They're going to pay more in personal income taxes. Well, this year is the year, I think, that we need to cut business taxes to zero. If we could take the billion dollars that businesses are going to pay, now that twenty billion dollars that's a general fund, like eighteen billion is personal income taxes that, that uh, the wage earners pay. There's about a billion dollars that's the, the business taxes, and then there's some that are lottery funds, uh, uh, alcohol taxes, cigarette taxes, that kind of stuff. So, but the majority of it is personal income taxes, right? If we took, if we gave businesses that break where we said, look, we're gonna get rid, of, we're gonna eliminate business taxes in order to so they basically have a hundred bucks that they have to pay the Secretary of State's office every year just to say, here's my business name and I'm operating this way. That's, that's all they'd have for, for expenses as a business. What that would do, and, and, and they would work on rolling regulation back, when you talk to business people, the taxation's too high and the regulations are too much for startups in Oregon. Right? So if we, get, if we got rid of those hurdles, to actually starting your own business, we'd have a lot of people start businesses. There'd be a lot more people hired. There'd be a lot more opportunity out there for people to actually get jobs. The more people that are employed in the state of Oregon, the more wages that are made, the higher is going to be the money that goes into that general fund, right? And, I, and I'm not talking about just expanding it that way. But, but in order to get, in order to replace that billion dollars that we give the businesses a break on, 
That's what I'm talking about. That, I think that would be doable like within just a, a year or two, right? Because that, and, and that's what the public employees unions and the teachers unions, they're focused on trying to drag more money out of businesses, right? If we could get them to understand that's hurting them. That is actually hurting their cause. Because when you try to raise taxes on businesses, 98 just being on the ballot, businesses left the state over. Over in Eastern Oregon, the potato sheds and whatnot over there that, that caved in because of weather, they all moved to Idaho, right? Why? Federal, federal minimum wage in Idaho is $7.25 an hour, right? How, you know, and they're staring down, they're looking at the state of Oregon that all they're continuing to do is trying to figure out how to restrict their business and how to raise taxes on their business. So anyway, that, that, that's key. But see, that, that deficit is what's driving this right now. And a Alan Alley, he ran for governor last time, I think. But anyway, he's run before. But anyway, he was up at the executive club and he kind of did a presentation it's up in Portland. It's like the first Wednesday of every month or something like that. But anyway, he did a presentation on the PERS system of what the actual def or what the actual cash flow is needed to actually meet the demand for what we've already committed ourselves to in Oregon. It's not the, the reason they're using 25 billion is because the 25 billion is based on we're supposed to have $80 billion in the fund right now. If, that, if we had $80 billion in the fund right now, and we got 7.2% on that money out into perpetuity, we're $25 billion short. So we don't really only have $55 billion in the fund right now. We don't have 80. That's, that's where the deficit is. But the $25 billion deficit they're using, that number, is based on the fact that they believe we're going to get a 7.2% return forever on this 55 billion, so it's going to make money. Well, if you look at just cash flow, how much is it actually going to cost us not paying any attention to returns or anything? What is the money that we got to come up with as Oregonians to actually cover this PERS uh, commitment? It's $209 billion over the next 30 years. $209 billion. That's what it is. So, so, you know, no matter what you do with the rate of return, the, the cash flow that we're going to need is $209 billion. And, and one of the things that they're not really talking about in this $25 billion deficit is they're assuming that we're going to, that that works is if we continue to hire people for the state of Oregon and continue to have them pay into the system. If we was to ever stop hiring, the whole thing would collapse like a Ponzi scheme because there's not enough revenue coming in to cover the, the, the benefits. So one of the things that, that Alan talked about, which is, and, and this is, you know, when you're committed not based on anything other than a promise, not based on, you know, a 401k, if you put your money in a 401k, you have so much money and it gets a certain return, that's what you get. Right? That's, that, that's what we need to go to for the state of Oregon. We can't continue to promise, you know, this system because they said, well, we did tier three and that's fixing it. It's only, it's only about 10% lower than what the other one was. So it's not fixing it. It's, it's, it's another ticking time bomb. So there's 200, 209 billion that we, that we owe. But the only way to get out of this is we have to have more private employment and less government employment. It's really simple, right? I'm just a simple guy. We have 4 million people in the state of Oregon. There's 1.8 million people employed, okay? There's 300,000 people employed in government. That's one out of six jobs. The library will close in 15 right? minutes. That is unsustainable. To check out to the circulation desk on the first floor now. So that means for every person who's working there's five people working in the private sector to pay one person working in the government sector. No way. I mean, just from your what, what five people make and pay in taxes is going to cover this guy. It's not going to. It's not going to happen. So out of that 300,000 people that are employed in the state of Oregon in government, 
Ten percent of those are federal workers, right? Thirty thousand of those work for the federal government. You know what their average wage is? It's in the seventy thousands, seventy-five thousand. Those those are the best jobs in Oregon, working for the federal government. You look at the state and the local, the other two hundred seventy thousand. Those average wages are right around fifty-five or so. So why can this? Why can the feds pay seventy-five thousand? Per year, and the, and the state of Oregon pay fifty five thousand. Anybody know? Why can the federal government pay more? They can deficit spend, right? They're doing it every day, right? So, used to be when you see a BLM or U.S. Forest Service guy years ago out there working, they have an older work truck, and the guy actually looked like he was a logger or he looked like he was a worker. What do you see now? Brand new equipment. The guys don't even get out of the truck. I mean, you wonder what these guys do? Literally, just for an example, I, I've studied Harney County over there, you know, Burns area. There's 7,000 people live in Harney County, okay? There's, um, there's 2,400 jobs out of those 7,000 people. There's 2,400 jobs. A thousand of those jobs are government. A thousand out of 2,400, okay? Right, so so 700 of them are are uh, local, state and local. They're making 40 grand a year out there. 300 of them, 300 of those people who are working in government over there, those are federal employees. You know what they make over there? They make 75,000 a year, average. Those 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 uh, 300 federal employees. And you look at the 2,400 people, or the 1,400 people that are left over that are in the private sector in Harney County, it's $24,000 average a year. That's what that, so you got, you got regular worker, public, or regular private sector employees in Harney County, 24,000 a year. You got 700 people working for the state and, and uh, the local, making about 40,000 a year. And then you have these 300 federal employees that are making 75,000 a year. So guess what the base industry in Hardy County is now? Government. Government employment. You go back to the mid 80s, do you know how many wood products jobs were in Harney County in the late 80s? 700 jobs, right? That was their base industry, 700 jobs, and they paid good money, right? So they've taken these 700 jobs, you know how many there now? This was from like 2016 or whatever, the employment numbers that I could find. Six, there's six wood products jobs in Harney County. So, so, so see what they've done, and, the, and this is done, so just studying this one little rural county, this is what's going on all over the West. They have pumped the money into the, the federal government through their, quote, management of, of the people of Oregon's land. That's the way I look at it. All the land in Oregon that's public belongs to the people of Oregon. So then you say, well, I thought the feds, no, it belongs to the people of Oregon. It doesn't belong to the federal government. They're managing it, part of it. Should they be? That's a question. That's a question that, that I think the wildfires say, no, they shouldn't be. You know, when, when, when ranchers get sent to jail because they, they try to protect their water rights and they win in state court and then they tick off the BLM and then they wind up getting charged with arson and they have to go to prison? Twice. Twice? Yeah, twice. See, I mean, you know, and, and, and you guys all know the Bundys were acquitted today, right? No, they didn't. They were acquitted. The, the judge uh, threw out the case with prejudice. So which means what? The prosecution that Stephen Myrie, he broke every rule in the book to try to convict these guys. And that was wrong. And they, they were after him. So you guys all heard years ago, Clive and Bundy owns a federal, owes the federal government two million dollars, right? You heard all that. You know how much he actually owed him that came out of the court case? Did you guys hear how much he actually owed him? It was it was less than nine thousand bucks. So when people hear that, you know, because you, you got to give the truth in court, 
You don't have to get the truth in the media. Two, there's quite a bit of difference between $2 million and $9,000. I think most people understand that. You know, that's the kind of stuff. So, natural resource management in Oregon, we need to have, we need to work for getting the counties managing our forests again. I mean, the state of Oregon has land. We've got a one sea lands in the west. We've got a lot of stuff that's, quote, managed by the U.S. Forest Service or the BLM that really there's no revenue coming off of that to go to the counties. And, and you know, when they were getting taxes in lieu of, 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 of logging, we're not getting that anymore. The federal government cut that out. So they're, they're squatters on the land now. They're not... You know, you got all every county that has public land attached to them that they have no revenue coming off of to pay for schools, public safety, and infrastructure. They're dying, and you got to know that down here. So the answer is, we have to elect a governor that is one vote of three on a state land board that is going to agree to balk in the state for us and work toward getting the federal government out of the state of Oregon and have those forests and those sales managed by the county. So the revenue from the revenue from those natural resource based businesses goes to the county to pay for education, public safety, and infrastructure. Right now what we do in Oregon is the twenty billion dollars I was talking about um, this part of the general fund, half of that money we turn around and we send back to schools every every year, right? Because the state, what we did with education with Measure 5 back in 96, remember Measure 5? We said we're going to put a property tax limitation measure that is only going to go up 3% because we're not going to fund schools with a property tax anymore. We're going to push it off on the state, all right? And, and that campaign was all about if this passes, the sky is going to fall. Barbara Roberts was governor then. But if this Measure 5 passes, the sky's going to fall. You know, everything's going to go upside down in Oregon. We're never going to be able to, this is going to be horrible. Well, it passed. So we pushed the funding off on the state. Anything that they needed to get. So here's what happened, in my opinion. Immediately after that passed, they consolidated the school districts. Right? In 97. 1997, they consolidated the school districts. What's that mean? That means that there's no more school boards for K through 8 anywhere in the state. They were all put under a high school. Every single K through 8 school had to now be under a high school. And they got one board at the high school level, so they they got rid of local input, right? And they moved it all up here. Now, the teachers union, if they want money for schools, they got 90 legislators that they got to convince that they want that money and they're going to get it, right? Here's what I like to do. I like to say, I like to set it up so that whatever comes into the general fund, 50% of that money goes back to the counties. Just, just on kind of the same formula we use now for the school thing, but it just goes back to the counties. And let the counties fund education, use that money to fund education, infrastructure, and public safety, right? And and force it so that um, no longer is it that they have to go to just these 90 legislators, but they have to go back to the counties to actually say that they're, you know, the counties have to control that money and how much they're going to use for school, how much they're going to use for public safety. And you say, that's, how are they going to do that? Well, we have to have, education has to have some consequences for uh, some competition. Right now, there's no competition. We just went from spending $10,000 per student two years ago to spending $13,000 a student just two years later, and we still have one of the lowest graduation rates. The library closes. Please proceed to the exits on the first floor now. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, but that's Kirby. So I forgot what I just said. Anyway. Graduation so, rates. So, yeah, graduation rates. 10,000 to 12,000. Yeah, so, so, so we got this graduation rate. Well, we need competition. We have to have, parents are no longer in control of what happens. 
If they can't afford to send their kid to a public school or a private school, or can't get them in one of the charter schools, you know, then you know they're stuck because they, economically they just can't do it. Well, if we if we took oh I know what I was going to say um, McMinnville High School, they they have they uh, uh, as far as economically it's pretty the school has about sixty percent that are considered poverty, right? But yet they have one of the highest graduation rates in the state of Oregon. Okay, so because of that, Betsy DeVos came here. Mm -hmm. right, you guys saw that? Outside McMinnville High School with a sign that said, thank you, Betsy, for coming, you know, and another one that said school choice, you know. Well, there was 200 educators, or I guess they were a union, had the most disgusting things to so here, So here you got McMinnville High School administrator, they're doing a great job there, so the Secretary of Education for the United States comes to McMinnville to say, thank you, you're doing a good job, you know, trying to figure out why that was. Outside, why inside she's honoring this person, you got 200 education union people out there with the most despicable signs attacking Betsy DeVos that you can ever imagine. And when her car went by, I mean, they went running down the street, you know. I mean, it looked like it was the most, it was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen as far as, it was the most undignified thing I've ever seen in my life. And I, and I tried to have conversations with people that were protesting, and they literally said to me, we're not here to engage, we're here, just here to protest. Right? They weren't, they weren't even going to talk about why they were there. But one lady started talking about the fact that, you know, if we go to school choice, because I have school choice on, if we go to school choice, it's going to cost the teachers money and all this kind of stuff. And I said, listen, if we took, think about this, because here's what we've done. We've consolidated the school system. We, we put, we, 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 made, we made, a lot of our communities have empty schools now, where I live. Detroit no longer has a school. Gates no longer has a school. All those kids now have to go to Mill City to school. So they shut down all the rural schools. So and they're pumping them more and more into big, big schools. Supposedly to save money. Is it saving money? No. Right? Why can't we say, why can't we say in the state of Oregon, let's have a voucher system where we're going to give the parents 70% of what the state is currently spending, okay? If they, you take $13,000 and you take 70% of that, it's about it's a little over $9,000. Do you think a parent could find a place to get their kids educated for $9,000? That's a 30% savings over what we're doing right now? I think so. And I bet you I could find teachers that are looking at that $25 billion hole in the purse system, and the young teachers that are going, hmm, I'm probably not going to get my retirement, right? You're going to see these teachers out there, and I'm going to say to them, look, why don't you guys, why don't you, why don't none of you guys come out? The library is closed. Why don't none of you guys come out and form a K through 8 school, right? Nine teachers. And let's have 200 kids go there. Right? At 9000 bucks a kid, that's $1.8 million. You think you could educate 200 kids for $1.8 million? And that's already a 30% savings. You could go back to local, you wouldn't have to bus anybody. You could have a local school. Think about buildings that are uh, used on the weekends, but they're not used during the week. Where are those places? Can you think of any of those that they could possibly put a 200, what's that? The Very good. So, so you got big churches out there that that they could have 200 kids school there pretty easy, and and all the local kids right around her, they could walk to that school. No more busing. I mean, think about all the employees that we hire now for busing and janitors. And is that the way our society is going? I mean, is that the kind of jobs? Is it all brick and mortar kind of jobs now? No, it's internet. My daughter, my youngest daughter, or my, yeah, my youngest daughter, Lydia, when she was a junior, she came to us just before she was a junior at State and High School. She pretty much had taken everything she could take at State, right? And she said, can you guys homeschool me again? And I looked at her and I said, are you crazy? It was hard enough to get you to the sixth grade, you know? 
So we started investigating the online school, that's a charter school that Jeff Krupp has up in Sio. I think now it's in Mill City. So she got, she signed up for that and she got into that school. Do you know what that cost to educate her for a year, for the last two years? She took French, it was all online. You know how much it cost to educate her? It was 700 bucks. It didn't cost us, but that's what they got from the school district to provide my daughter's education because basically she needed a computer, right? And she and all the curriculum was already downloaded. So like this school that we got 200 kids in, right? You could buy the kids all $400 computers and tablets and download all their all their um, books on there. And and so so you know you figure 400 bucks a kid times 200 kids. How much is that? 200 times 400. Was that eighty thousand mm dollars? -hmm. So eighty thousand dollars take away from uh, from one point eight million. You still got quite a bit left. So you got nine. You got nine teachers. Let's say you paid them. Let's say you paid those nine teachers sixty grand a year, right? Because they're going to have to provide their own retirement and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you still got money left over. That's what I'm saying. Is that if if I could get nine teachers K through eight to form an LLC, start a school. Right and say, okay, we're we're gonna try to we're shooting for 200 kids, and you had these 200 kids schools all over the place. You know, one of the governor's jobs is education. He's in charge of. I, sh I shouldn't use the word he because that's me. They, because we got a she now. They are in charge of education. The governor's in charge of education in the state of Oregon. So. I know a lot of people that are educators, and I know a lot of guys that uh, have been involved in um, the charter school stuff. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to help the state figure out what to do, but guess what? They don't want to hear it. They don't. They won't listen. The difference between me and them is, as governor, I'm going to say, "Look, I don't. I know what I don't know. I know what to say. Hey." Here's what we're, here's here's the idea. Here's what we we need to do. How do we do that? And these guys that are, have have a, uh, experience in education and setting up these charter schools, there's people out there that'll do it. But so many things that we have at the state that are broken, there's people out there that know what to do, mm -hmm. but they're not interested in listening because it would it would cost them employees. It would cost them. Because if they got to cut back on the number of employees, every time that they, that they have to put a, a hiring freeze on the state of Oregon, that's a voter that they're not going to get in the future. Because that's their voter, that's their voter base, you know. And um, I, just, I just keep going back to, but educate, and then, um, but our natural resource base, we need to get farming, ranching, logging, mining, fishing, we need to have those things in order. We are a natural resource based state. When we say we're not going to do this, or you know, when we lock things up, we're, we're just killing ourselves. You're not going to run a state like this on tourism, minimum wage jobs. There's just no way. You, you've got to, we're going to have to get back to doing reasonable logging. You know, I'm going to start using the word reasonable because you know what, where they've used the word reasonable? Reasonable second right amendment. Restrictions. You've heard that, right? We didn't have reasonable gun rights restrictions. That's why I use the word. There's no, no, such, no such thing as a reasonable second amendment gun right restriction. There is none. But I think there's a reasonable logging that we could do in Oregon, like clean this stuff up, and you know. Um, but right now, um, when it comes to first and second amendment things, I, I think Trump's election was about this. Political correctness, driven by the left, basically is trying to make all of America think the same. Okay, so the oxymoron that just drives me crazy: diversity training. What is diversity <laughs> training designed to do? It is designed to get you to think the same. Right? Mm -hmm. It's bizarre. So. What happened to, we have a difference of opinion, you have your opinion, I have my opinion, we don't agree, but we can still live together and we can still communicate without calling each other haters and we need that back in our society. 
I've, I'm going door to door. This is my seventh. Uh, I am on a 33-day tour of Oregon uh, covering all 36 counties. So this is my seventh day. And prior to January 2nd, I was going up to Portland. I did six breakfasts, two on Monday, two on Thursday, two on Friday. I gained weight because I was eating two breakfasts a day. But um, I did it in Multnomah County, Clackamas County, and Washington County because those are the three most populated counties. So after I would do the breakfast up there, I would go door to door. So I ran into this guy that was 20 years in the Air Force. He had just moved to uh, Beaverton. And um, him and his wife, he said, let me give you an example of what's going on, Bruce. I'm sitting at a restaurant with my wife. We're having a conversation about something. I say something that I believe strongly. And, and you know, we were having this conversation. She, he said, somebody from the next table thinks they have the right to get up, come over into our conversation, and just start attacking me verbally. You know, and I just said, listen, I wasn't talking to you, and I don't care. I don't even know who you are. You're not part of this conversation. He says, what's wrong with these people up here, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, and you guys have seen, you guys have seen, uh, you know, even during the election, you know, people get beat up because they were Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's bizarre. It's the most bizarre thing you've ever seen. We have to get back to the point where we have. A First Amendment right is that you have the right to, you know, you have the right to worship, you have the right to believe what you believe about God. See, in a Christian nation, a Christian nation is the only place where um, uh, you're, you're, you have the freedom to worship or not, right? Because, number one, God doesn't require us to come to Him, right? He doesn't say you have to, right? He, he's, he says He wants you to. And he's made the invitation, but he doesn't force you to, right? Every other country you go to, if you go to a Muslim country, and, you, and, and they want you to be a Muslim, and you proselyte in that country, Christianity, whack, you know? I mean, it's, it's not free there. But in our country, you have the freedom to believe or not believe. And only Christian nations, you're going to have that. Because, and as Christians, you know, we're, we're not going to think the same as everybody else. But, well, we still live together. I mean, our command is to love our love everybody. So regardless of what, if I have a difference of opinion with somebody, I don't hate them, right? But I find increasingly that they hate me because I, you know, you, you make a statement and boom, you know? And you're like, hey, where'd that come from? Listen, and you have these conversations. Hey, you can believe what you want to believe. I happen to believe this strongly. I don't have to think like you, and you don't have to think like me. We got to get back to that, where we can still function as a society. And that, and, but like I said, that whole thing was driven to the point I think in this last election where people said, "I've had enough of this." You know, it's driven by the. It's driven by, you know, so many things in our society try to drive us into, in, into that shaming you into believing what you believe, and not speaking out what you believe, especially as Christians. They shame you into not speaking out when you hear something that's wrong, and, and, and somebody asks your opinion, and, and you say, "Well, you know, I could give my what I really believe, but I know it's going to get ugly, so I'm just going to, you know what I mean? You've been there, and it just depends on where you are." So, um, immigration. When it comes to immigration, we, we back there we've got um, in Oregon. Here's what happened in Oregon. We we have a, a law in the books that is. Um, that was clear back from when Atiyah was, was governor uh, that, that says that you cannot go after somebody just based strictly on their immigration status. Okay, but there was a number of exep exceptions in that law that said if the person was a criminal, right, that the law enforcement officer, if they find someone's a criminal, there was a federal warrant out for their arrest. There was a number of, of, of exceptions where our law enforcement officer can work with, with the immigration people, and it's fine, okay? That's what the law says. Kate Brown, as soon as Trump was president, she wrote an executive order that if you read it, it doesn't really do anything different from the law, but, it, it, but in reality, what it, what it has done is all of our law enforcement officers will not touch 
I mean, they, if they've got somebody that they're releasing that is, they know is an illegal and they're a criminal and they're releasing them pending trial, they will not, they will not contact ICE. They will not contact immigration. They feel like they're restricted from doing that. And that's what this IP22 is about, is to stop that sanctuary status. Number one, if you read the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 4, it says the Congress shall have the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Okay, we have already given that right, as states, we have given that right to the federal government to decide who's going to become a citizen, who can come here, you know, visas and all that kind of stuff, we're all under that, that uh, rule of naturalization. The states have already deeded that right to the federal government. For us to say we're a sanctuary state, I believe is unconstitutional and illegal. And the, and the, the Attorney General for the United States, if they cut off the funds to Oregon, and they have every right to because we're not operating uh, legally or constitutionally. So, and it's funny because they pick and choose when they do that, you know. Uh, this issue, it's one that's already been deeded. How many other issues are have not been deeded that are Tenth Amendment right issues for the states that we just let the federal government run over us? Which I believe the BLM, the U.S. Forest Service, the National Education Association, all, all education stuff directing the states to do something about education from a national point of view. Education is not in the Constitution. I mean, there's so many things like that that they are doing that uh, they have done to us through the administrative state that that we just got to start moving the ball back the other direction. And there's two measures right back there that are going to be on the ballot in the general election that I am back into the Hill. Stop public funding of abortion, number one. Number two is stop the sanctuary status, IP22. Those two are going to be winners, right? And they're going to be big winners. And so what, what these conservative races have shown us, there's 200,000 votes in Oregon that a conservative candidate in go for governor will get that a moderate will not get, right? And here's the reason. I go to dinners with Democrats who are conservative and they're excited about me running, but they will not change parties, but they will vote for me if I get through the primary election. Mm -hmm. But you think if a, a moderate wins in the Republican Party, you think that Democrat's going to vote for him, that conservative Democrat? He's not voting for him. And another thing is we, we think this way, Republican, conservative, independent, moderate, Democrat, liberal. That's kind of the spectrum. That's not true. There's a bunch of independents that are more conservative than the Republican Party, and they're ticked at the National Party still to this day, and they will vote for a conservative, mm -hmm. but they will not vote for a moderate. Mm -hmm. Measure 101, basically, it's, it's a tax on health care, right? And it's... Um, Basically, anybody that didn't have a lobbyist in Salem to protect their interests got taxed. Mm -hmm. So all the unions did get taxed. Mike Nearman, you know Mike Nearman from Polk County? When I was in Tillamook County, he was up there giving a presentation on 101 to the Tillamook County Republicans when I was there. And this is what he said. He said, the public employees unions got exempted. The other, the big, other big unions got exempted. Any, any big employers that are self-insured are exempted. So basically, the people that got taxed were, were the people that are on the exchange that can least afford insurance and small employers. That tax is on those folks. It's not a tax on all health care. It's just a tax on this specific person. And here, here's what happens if the no vote is successful. February session is going to be all about how to figure out how to fill that hole, right? If it, if it passes and the, and the tax stays there, then the February session is going to be about how to get more taxes out of you. And guns. And guns, yeah.
So, so, you know, I mean, I got my ballot, my wife and I voted the first day and sent it back, you know. It's pretty easy to do that, you know, because I was going to be on the road. So, but yeah, you know, I mean, and it's not, when you read it, the, the problem is these ballot titles and stuff are controlled by the people that are basically against the measure. So when they write the ballot titles that get approved, they don't, they're not even, they don't make sense. So what most people do when they try to figure out who to vote, how to vote, is they'll read in the back and they look who's for it and who's against it. As one guy told me, he says, I just had to look to see who was for it and I could see all the people that were for it, and I decided, you know what, if they're all for it, then I gotta vote no. Uh -huh. You know? And that's, you know, I mean, if you read the, 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 the voter pamphlet, yeah. uh, when you look at the Republican Party platform, number one, uh, very pro life. The, the party platform is very pro life, it's pro liberty, it's pro. Um, in our Republican Party platform, it says Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 17 says that the, that the federal government should have 10 square miles for Washington, D.C., and courts and forts for military purposes. That's all the federal government is supposed to be owning. So these 11 western states who have all this land locked up, Oregon has 53% of our land quote, managed by the federal government. And this is the people of Oregon's land. It doesn't belong to anybody in any other state. It belongs to the people of Oregon. So, do you know, so that's one issue. It's the pro-life and the understanding who owns the land in Oregon is the big one. And then also, the sh one of the things that got included in the platform this year is the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer of the county. They didn't use the word chief, but that's the general gist. So for instance, when you elect a sheriff, his job is to protect the citizens of his county. Who is he protecting them from? From the federal government? Mm -hmm. From the state government? From anybody that comes in there to encroach upon their rights illegally? Right? So like if an IRS guy wants to come to your door, Here's the way I look at the federal stuff. If a federal has a warrant or anything, he should be taking that warrant to the county sheriff and say, Sheriff, sir, I have this warrant for this citizen. Well, let me look into it. You know? I mean, that's your protection is, is the sheriff, the sheriff. See, Glenn Palmer over in Grant County, he understands that. In fact, here's what Glenn did. The U.S. Forest Service, they were armed in his county. And they pulled their guns on people, checking their fire permits and their wood permits and all kinds of stuff in the county. So what Sheriff Baltimore did is he wrote a letter to the U.S. Forest Service and he says, listen, you will not exercise police powers in my county unless you can show me in the Constitution where he had the right to do that. End of story. So they, you know what they call Grant County over there? They call it a U.N. free zone. <laughs> That's what they call it, literally. Because he won't allow anybody else to operate police powers in his county except him. Think about what counties, and just think about what we do when we say, uh, I want to attract somebody to, to my, we want to attract some, a business to our area. We cut their taxes, cut their property taxes, we give them a break for five years. Why don't we just do that all the time? Here's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see Oregon cut the taxes on businesses to zero, mm -hmm. and then let counties compete for those businesses based on how much property tax break they're going to give them to where you know wherever they're going to be, right? Because counties would still have the ability to do that, you know. Then then you then you can leave, you know, because it. I think that when businesses come here and and we have more jobs. Uh, you know, to me, that's a way to have minimum wage rock raise, is you got so many job opportunities out there that nobody can hire anybody for minimum wage because nobody's going to work for that. They're going to, they want more. So I was talking to a guy from UPS. He said our starting wage is like 16, 17 bucks an hour, but right now we can't hire anybody for that. So we're, we have to pay 23 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. And that's something because they just, 
They can't find him. And I think about, you know, when they had the big boom going on in East uh, uh, Montana and South Dakota with the oil, they were making 18 bucks an hour burgers over there. 18 bucks an hour. Because they couldn't find people to work. See, and that's the thing. I think, I think as we're raising, as minimum wage goes up in Oregon, businesses need a break. Now's the time to do it. And, you know, I, and I, I don't think there's a, you can't put the, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And, and as soon as somebody starts making more money, you can't take money out. You're just not going to be able to do it. So, you know, we can, if we get this where we just cut, you know, change the law or wherever it is, that's where it is. But, but hopefully the, the economic engine from getting those, those businesses going is going to cause enough opportunity where there's very few, the minimum wage jobs are like teenagers are supposed to be doing those, you know. Yeah. And the, the wages are so high, teenagers can't get a job. My kids, when they were growing up, my son had to take the weed whacker and walk door to door and say, hey, I'll cut that for 20 bucks because there was nobody hiring him because the wages are too high. There's another thing, we need, we need vocational training in our yeah. schools, there's all kinds of things that we, we need.